Welcome to the Georgia Archives Virtual Lunch and Learn Program. I'm Kayla Barrett, Deputy Director. We are glad that you've joined us for our February presentation, Colonial Georgia, the Oglethorpe Years with author Robert Jones. Our Lunch and Learn programs are held on the second Friday of the month and are sponsored by Friends of Georgia Archives and History, and we thank them for their support. During this pandemic, we want to offer you Lunch and Learn programs safely in a virtual format. We want to thank our colleague, Alec Hawthorne, for taking care of the technical side of these virtual presentations. Alec will upload the video of this Lunch and Learn to our YouTube channel, Georgia Archives. If you have friends who are unable to watch the presentation live, they don't have to miss out. They are all available on our YouTube channel. We are pleased to have as our February Lunch and Learn presenter, Robert Jones, who will answer any of your questions at the end of his presentation. Robert served as president of the Kennesaw Historical Society for 21 years and also served as a member of the executive board of the Kennesaw Museum Foundation for 17 years. The Museum Fund Foundation helped fund the 45,000 square foot Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History in Kennesaw. Additionally, he has written over 50 books on historical topics, including Innovations of World War II, A Guide to the Civil War in Georgia, and Heroes and Heroines of the American Revolution. In 2018, Jones was awarded the American Women in American History Medal from the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And we're very happy to welcome Robert. Thank you, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the book you can see on the first slide there is available on Amazon if you'd like to buy it. Uh, and it goes uh, pretty close to what we're going to talk about today. So our topics will include uh, the founding of Georgia with Oglethorpe, the War of Jenkins' Ear, which was uh, kind of sarcastically named by a 19th century historian, but it was a real war. And then we'll talk about three different Protestant religious groups that came to Georgia while Oglethorpe was still here and made the, the uh, colony a success. We're not going to talk about DeSoto today, but I always get asked about him. So uh, DeSoto probably did come into Georgia uh, in his uh, 16th century travels. However, he it was a pass through. He didn't spend any time here, uh, so we don't really include him uh, when we talk about the founding of Georgia. Now, the guy who did found Georgia was James Oglethorpe, and you see that wonderful statue of him. And uh, in 1732, Oglethorpe and his associates are granted a royal charter for the province of Georgia, from the Savannah River to the uh, Altamaha River, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. Uh, we'll see a slide later uh, that will help you, but basically, if you think of Augusta down to Savannah and then down to Darien, that little slice of what we think of as Georgia today, that was that was it. That's, that was his original charter. So on November 17, 1732, Oglethorpe and 114 followers headed to Georgia on the ship Anne. February 1st, 1733, Oglethorpe and his followers settled near what would become Savannah, Georgia. And there is a very early view of Savannah. You'll notice it was uh, surrounded by trees with the, the river in the front. You'll also notice it was very much laid out in, in squares and rectangles. And unlike Atlanta, you could actually go around a block in Savannah. Uh, whereas in Atlanta, if you try to go around the block, you'll end up in uh, Augusta. February of 1733, Oglethorpe negotiated the purchase of land with the Yamacraw tribe and her chief, uh, Tomachichi. And there's a picture of Tomachichi there with his nephew. Uh, in 1735, uh, we should, probably should say that uh, Oglethorpe was a very moral man. Uh, uh, and he, he outlawed rum, slaves, and Catholics uh, in the colony and outlawed trading west of the Savannah River without a license. And the reason for that is it wasn't totally a taxing issue. It's because 
you got too far west of the Savannah River, you were getting into either uh, Creek or Cherokee land. And he was very careful with the, uh, the Indian uh, relationship. 1735, Oglethorpe founded uh, Frederica, St. Simon's Island, and Augusta. And Frederica would uh, eventually become the site of the great fort built during the Oglethorpe years. March 26, 1735, and we have a picture of it coming up. Indians in camp near Frederica performed a war dance for the colonists at uh, Frederica. So everybody was getting along pretty nicely then. Uh, it probably was Tamachichi, uh, but we don't know that for a fact. June 14, 1736, Oglethorpe, or actually his emissary noble Jones, founded Augusta. And Oglethorpe ordered that it be laid out on the same plan as Savannah, uh, which uh, saved on architectural fees as well as allowed you to go around the block. Now, some of you have probably heard Oglethorpe referred to as General Oglethorpe or Major General Oglethorpe. And uh, he did eventually reach that goal. 1737, he's commissioned as a colonel in the British Army, and he's given a regiment for defensive purposes in Georgia. And the reason for that at that point wasn't so much that they were worried about an Indian attack. There was rumblings of an invasion from Spanish Florida, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, September 1739, Oglethorpe visited Augusta for the only time, even though he is associated with its founding. There is the, uh, the wonderful painting of the uh, war dance uh, that uh, the colonists were uh, shown by the Indians. George has always been a little different from the other 13 colonies. So why was it established? So in 1730, Oglethorpe petitioned to form the trustees for the establishment of the colony of Georgia in America. And his original idea was to allow a place for ex-prisoners and the deserving poor to go to. Now, they had the system in England where if you owed somebody money and you couldn't pay it, they could put you in debtor's prison, which of course meant you could never pay it. So uh, he was concerned about these folks. Like I said, he was a very moral guy. And this was the original reason he wanted to establish this colony. And he would find out, probably somewhat to his chagrin, that while his plans were great from a humanitarian viewpoint, it was an economic disaster. And it would take more industrious groups, German Lutherans, Scottish Presbyterians, and the Methodists, uh, to uh, to really make the colony. And he did recover pretty quickly and he started inviting those other groups. Now I promised we'd talk a little bit about uh, the war with the Spaniards, the war with Spain, and uh, 19th century historian Thomas Carlyle referred to it as the War of Jenkins' Ear. Uh, 1731, a Spanish force boarded the British ship Rebecca off the coast of Florida and accused the captain, Robert Jenkins, of being a pirate. They cut off his ear. So, of course, Thomas Carlyle called the war the War of Jenkins' Ear in the 19th century, and it's been referred to as that ever since. 1734, Oglethorpe begins building military fortifications on St. Simon's Island, including, of course, the great fort at uh, Frederica. Uh, October 30, 1739, Britain declared war on Spain. Most of the fighting took place in the Caribbean, so Oglethorpe isn't directly involved at this point. There's Fort Frederica ruins and another view. January 1740, now General James Oglethorpe begins raiding forts west of St. Uh, Augustine. Now in England, we would refer to that as, as Augustine, but I think here we call it St. Augustine. Uh, May 1740, Oglethorpe captured Fort San Diego, Fort Piccolata, and Fort Mose, which are two miles north of St. Augustine. So he's getting closer and closer to the main Spanish fort. From June to July 1740, he begins a siege of St. Augustine. Now, he doesn't have any kind of modern artillery particularly, and as you're going to see in a moment, uh, the fort at Augustine is like really big and strong, 
And so his 27 day uh, bombardment using old uh, artillery uh, you know, launches and doesn't really have much effect. And then even worse, on June 26, uh, 300 Spanish and free blacks take back Fort Mose. Uh, Oglethorpe abandons the siege and retreats, leaving his ancient artillery. There's a wonderful drawing, 1742, of the south prospect of the Spanish fort in St. Augustine. And that's what he was trying to attack. Well, the Spanish were kind of ticked off that Oglethorpe invaded uh, Florida. So they decided they were going to invade Georgia. So July 5th, 1742, Don Manuel de Montiano, the Spanish governor of Florida, landed 1,900 troops on the south end of St. Simon's Island, and Oglethorpe retreated to the north, uh, back towards Fort Frederica. So there's two battles that happen. Uh, the first is July 7th, 1742, 9 o'clock a.m., the Battle of Gully Hall. A Spanish reconnaissance force runs into the, a Highland Independent Company and a group of Georgia Rangers about 1.5 miles south of Frederica. And they're driven back, they take 36 casualties. And we're uh, going a little ahead here, but one of the things that the Scottish Highlanders, the Presbyterians, uh, were known for was their ability to fight. And they basically were the center of uh, Oglethorpe's army, as well as the Georgia Rangers. Now, Oglethorpe personally led this assault. So if you sometimes think of Oglethorpe as a military man, that's the reason he fought in the Battle of Gully Hall, uh, which we're not talking about Verdun here or Okinawa. It's a fairly small uh, battle. Battle of Bloody Marsh, uh, July 7th, mid-afternoon. Oglethorpe's forces pursued the retreating Spanish after the Battle of uh, Gully Hall, and they eventually ambushed a larger Spanish force that had stopped for dinner. Spanish losses were around 200 to 50 for the British forces under Oglethorpe. Oglethorpe himself arrived after the fighting was over. So he was captain of a ship, but he uh, wasn't actually involved in the fighting. July 13, 1742, the Spanish retreated from St. Simon's Island and uh, yea, verily, the uh, Great War with Spain between Spain and Georgia was over. Now, I should point out that Georgia's been in invading Florida forever, and this is just the first example of it. In the Revolutionary War, Georgia invaded Florida three different times and was defeated each time. Seventeen forty-eight, the Treaty of Aix la Chapelle ended the War of Jenkins' ear, although for some reason they didn't call it that in the surrender documents, and uh, it ceded Georgia to Britain. So that's really the end of the uh, the fear from the Spanish in Georgia. Seventeen forty-one, trustees create two Georgia counties, Savannah and uh, Frederica. Now a series of events starts to happen that makes uh, Oglethorpe very uncomfortable. And one of them is in 1742, the prohibition on rum was removed. Now, Oglethorpe was a solid prohibitionist, didn't want uh, liquor, especially strong liquor in the colony. Uh, and that was kind of removed over his objections. And June 23rd, 1743, Oglethorpe returns to England and he never returned to Georgia. However, the colony is starting to blossom in terms of its trade. 1748, for example, in the course of this year, seven or eight vessels laden with Georgia produce sailed from Savannah. Among this number was a ship of 400 tons burthen. So we're starting to do uh, some heavy trading out of Georgia. And we're going to talk about one of the reasons they were able to do this. And another reason why... Uh, Oglethorpe was becoming very uncomfortable is because on January 1st, 1751, he'd already left by this point, but he knew it was coming. Slavery was made legal in Georgia. And the reason it was made legal is suddenly these agricultural crops like cotton uh, and uh, some others that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, they needed more labor in order to harvest them. 
So you look at two of the things that Oglethorpe really cared about, no slaves, no booze, uh, they're both gone by 1751. Uh, from 1751 to 1775, the Georgia slave population grew from 500 to about 18,000. So you can see it multiplied very quickly. January 14, 1751, 16 delegates meet in Savannah, electing Francis Harris as speaker in the First Assembly of Georgia. Now we should point out at this point, uh, this is all still under the crown. So this is an independent assembly in Georgia. This is an assembly working under the crown. June 20th, 1752, the original trustees resigned their charter. June 23rd, 1752, at the final meeting of the trustees, shortly after the Earl of Halifax, president of the Board of Trade, took an interest in Georgia, and Georgia officially becomes a royal colony. So, as I mentioned earlier, there were three Protestant religious groups that came to Georgia that really made the, uh, the colony successful. And uh, the first one is the Methodists, because they were there at the very beginning. Uh, October 14, 1735, John and Charles Wesley sailed for Georgia on the Simmons from Kent. Now, I should point out at this point, they're just two lowly priests in the Church of England. They're not Methodists yet. So I realize um, I'm using a little uh, literary license here to say the Methodists came to Georgia because they didn't really. Uh, but of course, later they did become Methodists. So 1735, Charles was appointed Secretary of Indian Affairs, something which he had no uh, experience in whatsoever, and John becomes a preacher in Savannah. March 9, 1736, Charles becomes chaplain to the town and the garrison at Frederica. He is not well accepted because he has a habit of preaching fire and brimstone sermons, uh, and this is a garrison town with full soldiers, and he's not real popular. August 16, 1736, Charles sails from Charleston to England, bearing dispatches for the trustees. He never returns to Georgia, so he's only in Georgia for a year. But John's still there, and John's getting into some trouble. Uh, there are wonderful stained glass windows there um, at Grace United Methodist Church in Atlanta. It's worth going in there just to see those wonderful stained glass. Uh, that's Charles on the left and, and uh, John on the right. So the trouble in Savannah with John Wesley, who I'm sure is a wonderful preacher, he kind of gets a crush on this lady called Sophie Hopkey. And John's very shy. And, you know, they take long walks together and sit on a park bench and gaze in each other's eyes. But John never gets around to asking her to marry him. Well, she says, the heck with this, and she marries somebody else. Now, in normal circumstances, that would be the end of that. Okay. August 9th, 1737, John is served with a warrant for refusing to serve Sophie at communion. Now, there's a couple of things here that are kind of interesting because, first off, uh, the, the, uh, the state has no business serving the church with a warrant because the, the pastor refused to serve somebody at communion. However, that being said, Sophia uh, hadn't done anything to deserve not to be served communion. And thirdly, <laughs> her father is the chief magistrate for Savannah. So you can see, John is not going to win this battle. September 1st, 1737, 10 bills against Wesley are presented to a grand jury, charging that John Wesley Clerk had broken the laws of the realm, contrary to the peace of our sovereign Lord, the King, his crown and dignity. On December 2nd, 1737, with the law nipping at his heels, Wesley, quote, shook off the dust of my feet and left Georgia. He, too, would never return. Now, some people have said to me before, well, how do we know all that's true? It just sounds like gossip. The reason we know it's true is Wesley put it all in his diary, which still exists. Now, if you look on the uh, United Methodist Church website, you will find his diary, but they've removed all this stuff. Uh, so you have to find his diary somewhere else online, and it's, it's in multiple places. It's well worth reading. 
Methodists continue to come to Georgia. Evangelist George Whitfield arrives in May 1738. And uh, a couple years later, he builds an orphanage for boys 10 miles south of Savannah called the Beth Bethesda Home for Boys. And you can see it was a pretty impressive uh, structure. And if you've ever been down to uh, Fort Pulaski, there's a wonderful monument there uh, to uh, Charles and John Wesley. You have to walk kind of down into the swamp to get to it, but uh, there it is. And uh, so the three of them, Charles and John Wesley, and then you see George Whitchfield on the right, who was also part of the Great Awakening. Um, they're really the, the forefronters of the Methodist movement in, uh, in America. Now, we know Charles Wesley uh, much better for the fact that he's uh, one of the most uh, profligate hymn writers in the history of Georgia. And I could start singing his hymns right here and it would take up the rest of our time, but don't worry, I'm not going to. Uh, but he's a famous hymn writer. He wrote some of the most famous uh, hymns of all time. John Wesley uh, really is kind of the founder of Methodism. And he writes a bunch of commentaries uh, on different books in the Bible and, and writes a lot of religious tracts. And both of them are preachers in England, and they will go on to be superstars. But when they were in Georgia, alas, they were not superstars. <coughs> German Lutherans come to Georgia. Yeah, I'm probably taking some poetic license here too. I had a lady said, and, and, and she was actually quite upset about it. She said, the Salzburgers were not Germans. No, no, no. If you look at a map today, it's in Austria. I'm with you. But back then, there was no Austria. It was all Germany and Austria. They're all part of the, the uh, uh, Holy Roman Empire, which every school child knows was not holy. It wasn't Roman. It wasn't an empire. But that's what Austria and Germany was. So Austria didn't exist at all. The reason we can use the term German is because, of course, Martin Luther was uh, from Germany. And when he wrote that wonderful translation of the Bible, he, he translated it into German, and it kind of becomes the foundation of Germany, uh, at least uh, from a folk uh, point of view. So December 28, 1733, the Salzburgers, Salzburgers had gotten kicked out of Salzburg, and a bunch of them set sail in the ship Purisburg for Charleston. Uh, March 10th, 1734, they reached the Savannah River. And Oglethorpe, who had begged them to come because he heard they were really good at this agriculture stuff, he greets them. And he chooses a site for them to build a city. Now, James Oglethorpe was a great man, but he probably wasn't the person you'd want deciding where your house was going to be because the site is basically a swamp. So he presents it to the Salzburgers and say, here's your swamp. And they arrive at Ebenezer, they start building shelters, they uh, draw lots for houses to be built in town, they observe the day of Thanksgiving, and, and more and more Salzburgers keep uh, arriving from Europe. Uh, by February 5th, 1736, the population of Ebenezer is 200 plus. February 9th, 1736, by this point, the Salzburgers had figured out that they were living in the swamp. Uh, so they complained uh, to Oglethorpe as to the suitability of the land upon which Ebenezer stood. So Oglethorpe goes to the town on a fact-finding mission, and he agrees it's a swamp. So he decides he's going to get up a new place. So June uh, 1738, the Salzburgers begin inhabiting the new place, which at the time was called New Ebenezer. It's Ebenezer now. And the original site was continued to use, be used as a cow pen. So that's how suitable it was for human uh, habitation. 1738, they start experimenting with raising cotton. These are the first people in Georgia that start to raise cotton. And March 13, 1739, in a letter to Oglethorpe, the Salzburgers claim to have had success with a rice crop. Nobody was expecting that one. So here you have two of the big cash crops in Georgia prior to the Civil War. 
they were both started by the Salzburgs, by the German Lutherans coming to Georgia. And then in 1742, Oglethorpe sends 500 mulberry trees to Ebenezer. He figures, well, heck, they figured out how to grow cotton. They figured out how to uh, uh, raise rice. Maybe they can figure out how to produce silk. So he sent them uh, a bunch of trees. And the Salzburgers are always industrious. There is new Ebenezer, and you can see it too is, is laid out in blocks and squares and rectangles. Uh, at, down at the bottom, that's the Savannah River. And then if you kind of look to the right of the town, you can see uh, that's Ebenezer Creek. And I should mention just as an aside, uh, some people go to this site not because it was the Salzburgers hanging out, but because of an event that happened in the Civil War. The uh, Sherman had a general called Jefferson Davis. Isn't that a fantastic name for a Union general? And uh, as, as Sherman was uh, going through Georgia and he was liberating the slaves all along the way, and a lot of the slaves started following Sherman along. And Sherman didn't have any food for them. He didn't know what he was going to do with them. Well, a bunch of them were following uh, General Jefferson Davis as he crossed the Ebenezer Creek. And he had these rafts, big rafts. And when he got all his men on the other side, he cut the rope. And the slaves all basically went down the creek to the Savannah River. And some of them ended up dying. And it was not one of the, uh, the great moments uh, in terms of race relations uh, in the, the war between the states. Anyway, back to the Salzburgers. 1744, the first Jerusalem church is dedicated. I'm going to see a picture of it in a moment. 1750, uh, 74 pounds, two ounces of raw silk are produced at Ebenezer. So now they're doing the, the, the cotton, they're doing the rice, uh, and now they're producing silk, which is expensive. It's a good export item. 1757, they erect a fort at Ebenezer. 1764, 8,685 pounds of silk is produced by the Salzburgers, over half of the colony's output. And then uh, November 19, 1765, the death of Johann Martin Boltius, who was the original pastor, and basically had run the settlement uh, from the time of its founding. Now, this is the Ebenezer Church as it looks today. This was actually built in 1769. Uh, it's still there today. Last I heard it was still being used. I will admit I have not been to the site for 10 years. I think 2010 was the last time. I'm told there is now a visitor center and archives there for the Salz, uh, Salzburgers also. Uh, and then if you want to see the Ebenezer Creek where the Civil War incident happened, you just continue down the road until it dead ends in the creek. You know you're there because you can't go any further. But that's the great church that they built. Okay, we've done about that is we've done the German Lutherans or the Salzburgers. So those are Presbyterians. So the Methodist great administrators basically built uh, Savannah. Uh, the, the Salzburgers great with that agricultural stuff. And so what did the Presbyterians bring to the, uh, the table? So 1735, Oglethorpe sends Captain Dunbar and Lieutenant Hugh McKay to Scotland to recruit settlers for New uh, Inverness, Georgia. Uh, January 10th, 1736, a group of Scottish Highlanders found Darien on the Altamaha River, bringing Presbyterianism to Georgia. March 1736, the Highlanders helped build Fort St. Andrews on Cumberland Island, Fort St. George on St. John's River. And later, they'll begin work on uh, Fort Frederica. So we now start to see what the Highlanders bring to Georgia. They essentially become Oglethorpe military force. And they uh, both act in the army, as we talked about during the War of Jenkins' Ear. And uh, they also start building the forts. 1737, the Highlanders formed the Highland Independent Company later known as Oglethorpe's Regiment of Foot and the Highland Rangers. Uh, 
1739, a petition against slavery is signed by 18 members of the Darien Colony. This does give you uh, an idea of who was for slavery and who wasn't. The Presbyterians weren't that much in agriculture, so they didn't see the need for it. Other groups did. Uh, November 1739, Highlanders joined the attack on the Spanish in Florida, led by James Oglethorpe. And 1767, I, I put in the name Lachlan McIntosh, because some of you are probably familiar with that from the Revolutionary War. Well, uh, in his early days, he uh, actually did a survey of Darien. He would go on to be a, a general of the a militia and then the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. And the reason you've probably heard his name, even if you can't quite place it, he's the guy that shot Button Gwinnett and the guy that killed Button Gwinnett in a, a duel. Uh, there's a very old uh, photo, Oyster Shell Road, the ridge shows old tabby ruins of abandoned buildings in 1910 of the Presbyterians. And uh, uh, tabby was basically sand mixed with uh, ground up shells. It's kind of like a form of concrete. There's a uh, visit of Oglethorpe to the Highlander colony in Darien, maybe around 1736. So the last part of this is what happens after uh, Oglethorpe leaves. It's a royal colonies from 1752 to 1783. As a rising economy, there's three royal governors. They start creating parishes, uh, you know, political uh, segmentation. There's increased tension in Georgia as a revolutionary war draws near. But there's also treaties and tension with the Creeks and the Cherokees. March 17, 1758, land acquired from the Indians is divided into parishes which include Christ Church, St. Matthew, St. George's, St. Paul's, St. Philip's, St. John's, St. Andrew's, and St. James. And uh, October 10, 1763, King George III annexes all land between the Altamaha River and St. Mary's to Georgia, and they create four new parishes. Now, this is the slide that I mentioned earlier, map of the first eight county of Georgia. Now, this is 1777. But you'll note the whole thing, even that late, is still along the Savannah River and then down the, uh, the Atlantic. And the rest of Georgia, you can see, you look over to the left, you see Creek Indians, and then uh, where we are right now, this kind of would have been the bottom part of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, so Georgia is still pretty much a coastal uh, city, if you include the Savannah River as being coastal. 1759, 10,000 pounds of exported goods. Uh, 1762, exports from Georgia included 7,500 barrels of rice. You know where that came from. 9,633 pounds of indigo, 1,250 bushels of corn. 1773, exports from Georgia, 121,677 pounds sterling. So Georgia is more and more becoming a uh, important trading colony. There were three different uh, royal governors, so that means they were appointed by the king. Uh, the only one I'll mention here is you'll notice the last one is Sir James Wright. And the reason for mentioning him is because he is the governor when the Revolutionary War uh, breaks out. October 26, 1765, Governor, governor Wright musters a statewide militia in Savannah to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the coronation of George III. These festivities are marred by demonstrations by the Sons of Liberty, who couldn't care less about the coronation of George III. Riots break out in Savannah uh, in 1766 over the stamp tax. Uh, January 1766, the governor tries to get a requisition for supplies for British soldiers stationed in Georgia and approved but the lower house of the assembly refuses to approve it. March 20th, 1766, the Stamp Act is repealed by Parliament, but other new taxes are soon on their way. And the tensions uh, continue to build. Uh, 1768, Parliament in uh, Britain votes in favor of new taxes on British manufacturers of goods, including paint, glass, and paper. 
Uh, the Georgia Assembly votes to endorse any tax measures taken by other British colonies. And so Governor Wright dissolves the Assembly. And there is some precedent for this uh, in British history. Oliver Cromwell uh, dissolved Parliament one time when they didn't do what he wanted. November 69, merchants of Savannah vote to refuse to export any goods subjects to the tax. Uh, February 1770, the Assembly passes a series of resolutions condemning various English taxes and statutes. Dr. Noble Wimberly Jones is elected Speaker by the Assembly uh, at about the time that it's uh, dissolved. September 1771, temporary Governor James Habersham dissolves the Assembly after they elect Jones Speaker. And August 10th, 1774, at a meeting in Savannah, resolutions were posted which showed support for the people of Boston after the report was closed. 1755, Governor Reynolds goes to Augusta to attend a peace conference with the local Indians, but the Indians don't show up. 1757, Lieutenant Governor Ellis signs a treaty with the Creek Indians. 1761, Savannah is surrounded by a palisade as protection against Indian attacks. 1763, a treaty meeting between English white settlers and 700 Indians occurs in Augusta with Governor Wright presiding. You can see that uh, this kind of reminds me of a Monty Python sketch, but you can see on one hand, the Georgia population didn't want to have to deal with the British Army, but on the other hand, it's kind of nice they were there when they were worried about the Creeks or the Cherokees attack. 1773, at a treaty meeting with the Indians in Augusta, Georgia takes over what will become Wilkes County. All told, the English Indians see 2 million acres. <clears throat> the population on the eve of the revolution, 18,000 whites and 15,000 blacks. And when the revolution breaks out, uh, Georgia runs uh, Governor Wright out of the colony on a rail. Well, not actually a rail. He hops a ship in Savannah before they can capture him. But he will be the only British governor in a Revolutionary War who will return to the colony of which he was governor of and actually sits as governor again during the, uh, the, uh, the fighting during the war. Now, of course, eventually he's kicked out again. Uh, but that's something that uh, only happened in Georgia, where they kicked the governor out, the royal governor, but then he returned. So I think I will leave it there. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff in Georgia history, but you don't hear as much about it as you do, say, Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or places like that. So uh, I will open it up in case Alec has any, any questions. Uh, if not, we still have some time so I can talk about my boyhood growing up in Pennsylvania. So, Alec, any? Uh... <laughs> we did have one comment at 12.06 while you were talking about things that weren't allowed in the college. Oh, okay. They say that lawyers were also outlawed. Are you familiar with that? I, I, I am. And that's, uh, uh, there's probably some people today who would think that was a good idea. Until they needed a lawyer, of course. <laughs> see we still have 41 attendees so others can ask their questions now in the chat if they'd like we'll give them a few minutes and uh anyone who missed parts of the video because of buffering or sound problems i am putting this up on the youtube channel this afternoon uh, the bramlets said thank you for the presentation i know them well Anonymous asks, why did Oglethorpe not want to run in Georgia? Well, I think part of it was just a moral issue, but he's concerned with carving out a functioning colony out of the wilderness. And the last thing he wants is to have a bunch of workers, whether they're agricultural or building uh, structures in Savannah or in the army, the last thing he, in the world he wants is for them getting drunk and rum every night. So that was probably the overriding issue. Let's 
Someone asked, will there be will the will we have access to the slides? Yeah, but it'll be part of the YouTube video. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, in 1751, 1775, did the slave population grow because of planters from South Carolina moving into Georgia? That was probably part of it, but the Georgia colony on its own was starting to get some pretty big, uh, I don't know, they called them plantations back in, but uh, was starting to get some pretty big agricultural areas. But yeah, some people from South Carolina did move in once they figured, hey, this is actually working. What became of the Salzburgers? If I remember correctly from my Georgia history in <laughs> third grade, many decades ago, the Salzburgers just died out? Uh, I think they more scattered. And, and part of the problem was during the revolution, uh, Salzburgers, some state, loyal to the king, some stayed loyal to the patriots, and eventually that, that kind of caused them to scatter, I think. There are still, there's a Salzburger society today of which uh, descendants of the Salzburgers uh, still meet, and uh, so as a, as a worshipping group or as a political unit, yeah, they, I guess they died out. But there's still quite a lot of people today in, in Georgia who are descended from them. Are you related to the Noble Jones family? I am not, but I appreciate anybody who refers to me as Noble. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. How did Oglethorpe invite groups such as the German Lutherans to Georgia in advertisements? <laughs> no, he just posted on uh, Facebook the advertisement. <laughs> Uh, he sent representatives to areas where he knew there might be people who would be useful. He got to know that, you know, former prisoner thing. Uh, and he actually sent people out to recruit them. Now, in the case of the Salzburgers, uh, they had just been kicked out of, of uh, Salzburg, uh, which, by the way, is right across the river from Hitler's uh, eagle's nest, where he used to spend his spare time. Uh, the, the Salzburg had just been kicked out of Salzburg, and they were starting to disperse to different places. The King of Prussia invited a bunch of them, and some of them went to um, the Dutch uh, uh, areas. And so actually, Oglethorpe got a representative over there just in time to say, hey, how about Georgia? And it's probably... Well, that and, and building an army is probably the most important things he ever did here in Georgia, here being Georgia. Let's see. Please tell the speaker to pronounce Salzburger as Salzburger, not Sal. That might be a, a an American versus German pronunciation, kind of like Volkswagen or Volkswagen. It might be just a personal taste. What are our best sources of information from the colonial period? That is, what type of records? Um, can't remember his name. If it comes to me, I'll, uh, I'll tell you. But there was an army officer uh, who fought in the revolution, who wrote a history of Georgia up until that time. And that's probably the most important early source we have um, because it was it was just about Georgia. It wasn't about the overall revolution. So he talks about Oglethorpe and the relation with the Indians and all of that. And the, the, some of the original documents are still around. The, the original charter for Georgia still exists. I think there's a copy here, if I remember correctly. But you would know better than me. Uh, so uh, but if I was going to pick one source, it would be that uh, uh, that book by the Revolutionary War Office, whose name I unfortunately can't remember. Do you? Yeah. 
All right. Georgia seems to have a lot less people of Scottish descent than other nearby states, such as Tennessee, Carolinas, Virginia, Kentucky. Is that an environmental issue? They weren't used to mid to south Georgia environments? Uh, that's an interesting question. They never really expanded a whole lot from Darien. I mean, they settled in Darien and, and new Scottish Presbyterians came to join them. Uh, but they never really expanded much from that area. Uh, so I, I don't know the answer to that. What are your thoughts on the Midway Sunbury area and that area's influence on colonial Georgia? Well, if I remember, uh, Sunbury is where the, the Battle of uh, Briar Creek was, I think which was a significant battle in the revolution, one that we lost. I, I've noticed in Georgia, we love to talk about Kettle Creek, but we don't talk about Briar Creek or Savannah, which were both losses. Uh, I could be wrong. This is off the top of my head. I think Sunbury was at least near where the battle of Briar Creek was. In 1753, regarding trading without a license, where could a colonist get a license? Was it granted from England or from Oglethorpe? Well, by 1753, Oglethorpe had left. Before he left, uh, yes, he could grant those kind of licenses. After he left, within a couple of years, Georgia had a royal uh, governor, and uh, you would you would go to the royal governor to get that kind of thing. What happened to the Church of England parishioners who stayed in Georgia during and after the revolution? Well, most of them uh, continued to be Church of England or eventually Episcopal, so that, that came later. Uh, it wasn't until, I'm trying to think, 1780, I mean, it was, it was much later when uh, John Wesley was trying to uh, name some bishops, Francis Asbury being the the most famous one, to send to the New World to proselytize. And the Church of England said, hey, you're just a priest, John. You need to be a bishop in order to appoint a bishop. And so John Wesley said, okay, well now I'm no longer a Church of England priest. I'm now a Methodist bishop. <laughs> so he, that's when he starts sending bishops to the United States. And now I forgot the original question. <laughs> You already passed it. What happened to the Church of England parishioners who stayed? Oh, oh well, they they uh, stayed as Church of England parishioners. Is it true that Tomachichi made a trip to London? Yes. If so, and, why? And took his uh, the nephew that you saw was holding the bird. Uh, he went with him, and Oglethorpe thought that was good publicity to show how friendly the Indians were. Can you speak on Major William Horton, Oglethorpe's number two in Georgia, and his influence on coastal Georgia? Uh, no. I don't know the answer. Name some hymns by Wesley. I knew somebody was going to ask that question right at the point that my mind totally went blank. How about, oh, four thousand tongues to sing? Uh, was certainly Charles Wesley uh, wrote a bunch of Christmas hymns. If I think any others, I'll say that. The Sophia story is interesting. <laughs> Not granting her communion, Wesley was casting a bad light on her character. Oh, yes. When in fact she had done nothing to deserve it. The Salzburger descendants are still living in the area. The actual Ebenezer residents just moved out of the town to outlying property. But there are Salzburgers all over Georgia. The Swiss arrived in 1735, settled around Vernonburg. They were also a group who arrived in the early time period. Why were the boundaries of what is now Georgia set? Right after the forced evacuation of the Native Americans, oh, 
Or were there more acquisitions beyond that? For example, what formed the boundary between Alabama and Georgia? <laughs> oh, dang, Jesus, 12.50. We could spend the next two hours talking about that. Okay, so there was something called the uh, Yazoo Land Scandal. And uh, Georgia decided that it owned Alabama and and uh, Mississippi. And if you look at early maps, it shows Georgia uh, going into those areas. And uh, the whole thing was a fraud. And this would never happen today, I, I understand. But the politicians were voting in these uh, things so that rich politicians could buy some of that land in Alabama and, and Mississippi that they were now calling Georgia. And eventually, uh, and this is literally true, the people of Georgia figured out they were doing it and they, they voted out some, some of the politicians. Uh, so uh, after the Yazoo land scandal, the federal government got involved and that's when the, they fixed the, the border between Alabama and uh, uh, Georgia. Some more songs by Charles Wesley. <laughs> And if, if, if anybody wants me to sing any of these, just give me the word. And can it be one of my personal favorites? Christ the Lord is risen today. You, you, you can just hear that Christ the Lord is risen. Uh, come now long expected Jesus. Oh, here we go. Christmas one. I knew there was a Christmas one here. Hark the herald angels sing. Love divine, all loves excelling. Oh, four thousand tongues to sing. I got that one. Uh, Soldiers of Christ arise, and that's just a shortness. But a lot of those songs are still sung in, in churches today. Thank you, Robert. Great job. Oh, I like that. <laughs> the Ebenezer Church is the oldest continuous Lutheran church in America. There is a museum there too. I think you mentioned maybe the museum. Like the Welcome Center and something like that. FYI, at Frederica, there is a painting titled The Trustees of Georgia that <laughs> show Old, old Thorpe and Tom Chichi. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, this is a good question to end on. If you were a hot dog and you were hungry, would you eat yourself? And on that note, I'd like to thank everybody who <laughs> attended today, and uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Okay, we'll start with words. Oh, you come up. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Robert, for your fascinating presentation. Uh, we appreciate your joining us. Uh, Next month's Lunch and Learn presentation is scheduled for Friday, March 12th. Fox Theater Institute programs and Georgia Historic Theaters will be presented by Director of Fox Theater Institute, Lee Barnes. Burns, sorry. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>